Hey everyone, it's Pastor Ben. I hope you're having a great Tuesday morning so far. Again, if you missed our announcement yesterday, uh, because of the resu- we resumed in-person services lately, that means my schedule is starting to get back a little bit closer to normal. It's still different than what it was, but we're a little bit closer to normal. And so uh, we're going to have to be changing up how often we do these devotional videos. Uh, so we'll be doing devotional videos on Tuesday and Thursday. And again, that'll hopefully fit into the schedule of still recording sermons on Sunday for online services, and then also having online uh, in-person services and Zoom Sunday school classes uh, Sunday afternoon and evening. If you want to be part of one of the Zoom Sunday school classes, if your kids want to be part of that, uh, let us know. We'd love to uh, give you an invite to that and send you an email that way. Uh, We're going to continue our series studying First John. So we're in chapter two now. Chapter one is is very uh, quick, but then chapter 2 comes in right after the heels. And one thing you're going to notice as we study uh, 1 John is that John seems to repeat himself. Now, he is actually just kind of building an argument slowly. So sometimes he takes a two steps forward, one step back approach to how he builds an argument. Sometimes that one step back is just him repeating a previous statement so that he can then build on that for a second time as he creates this stair-step argument that slowly builds. Another reason why uh, John's gospel is repetitive is that John's gospel is written in Greek uh, by the apostle John who really didn't speak or write Greek, uh, but he writes it himself. And so uh, you can imagine trying to write anything, any kind of letter, Um, or idea down in a language that's unfamiliar with you. If you took another language in high school, imagine trying to write a letter uh, of any form in that language that you took in high school. I bet you could probably get by, but chances are the words that you would be using are pretty simple and you would find yourself using the same words over and over again. Sometimes you would probably find yourself Uh, having to be creative in how you tried to communicate an idea because your vocabulary is limited by the fact that you just don't know this language all that well. And that's why we see John's writing in 1 John to be so repetitive is because he's he's writing in a language that he's not super familiar with. He he knows it well enough, uh, but again, he's using very simple terms, a very limited vocabulary. It's why if you ever want to learn Greek, you start with studying the Gospel of John and First John because it's some of the simplest Greek in the Bible. Uh, but we're going to continue here in chapter 2 uh, as we read uh, John writes, uh, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And again, John is going to repeat that idea of anyone who claims to say, I know Jesus, to be a part of Jesus, but doesn't act like him, is a liar, and the truth does not live in him. And John is going to be addressing this tricky element of our faith, which is how does our obedience fit in to our faith? Uh, there, It's tempting as we look at the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and how complete that forgiveness is to think that maybe our obedience doesn't matter, that now that we're forgiven by Christ, we can live as we please. We don't have to worry about sin or hurting others. We know we're forgiven and that we can live however we want. Uh, We can live la vida loca, as one of my professors used to call it. Um, That isn't the case. Uh, Obviously, there is, once we are forgiven by Christ, there's still an expectation of obedience. Again, as John makes it clear, we have to live as as Jesus taught us to live. And so sometimes Christians can swing hard the other way. Instead of thinking that our obedience doesn't matter, we can instead think that our obedience matters a little too much. And we think of our obedience maybe in terms of a scoreboard uh, where Jesus' score is so high because of what he did for us on the cross 
that we are just simply trying to somehow catch up to his score, that on the other side there's our score and our good deeds, our behavior, our obedience is just slowly trying to play catch up with the enormous score that Jesus has put up in the scoreboard. We're somehow trying to pay him back uh, for what he's done for us. Or maybe we think of our obedience in terms of a test, that there's some passing grade that we need to attain by being good enough. And again, when we look at how the Bible describes Jesus' forgiveness and how complete and total that forgiveness is, those ideas of thinking about our obedience don't really seem to make sense. Again, Jesus freely died for us. There's nothing that we have to make up for him. Uh, And also there's no test that needs to be Uh, passed through our behavior. Jesus forgives us and he allows us to be united with him regardless of our track record, regardless of our history. So why does our obedience matter? Why does it matter? If Jesus has really truly forgiven us, why does John write this so that we do not sin? Why is it so important that we do not sin? And as John explains in these verses, we obey Our obedience makes sense when we think of it in relational terms. Obviously, uh, we obey Christ because we want to have a relationship with him. And that's the reason why you would obey anyone. Think, look at how John describes how we obey Christ. We, We claim to know him. We know him. And when you know someone, you inevitably begin to change your behavior. Uh, when, you're, when I first started dating Avery, there came a point uh, in my relationship with her where I learned something about her. I knew her better. I learned how much she likes candy and uh, which candies were her favorite. I, I, I knew that. And now that I had that knowledge about her, it changed my behavior. Suddenly when I went to the movie theater, I didn't buy the same candy that I used to buy. I bought different candy, candy that I wouldn't normally buy. Um, And so all because I had this knowledge about Avery, about what her favorite candy was, and that changed my behavior. I bought different candy. I bought her favorite candies, not just my favorite candies. I also bought her favorite candies. And, And so as we know people, we change our behavior in order to improve our relationship with her. Just once I knew Avery's favorite candy, it would damage my relation, her relationship with her if I willfully brought, bought the wrong candy in the movie theater. Uh, the same goes for if, with your boss. Uh, once you, as you know your boss better and you know what their expectations of you are, you either adjust your behavior according to those expectations or you suffer the consequences of having a bad relationship with your boss. Once you know more about your spouse's preferences, you either adjust your behavior to those preferences or you suffer the consequences of having a poor relationship with your spouse. And the same goes for Jesus. As we know Jesus better, as we learn his commands, as we learn his preferences, we adjust our behavior accordingly because we desire a good relationship with him. And our behavior impacts our relationship with Jesus the same way that our behavior impacts our relationship with our spouse, with our boss, with our brothers and sisters, moms and dads, any other relationship that we might experience here on earth. And so that's how John kind of puts it into perspective. We, we know him. We try to be like him. As you desire a relationship with someone, you, you slowly try to emulate them more and more. And again, we're going to talk probably more about this as we continue to study 1 John. But I want you to be thinking about why does our behavior matter? Well, it matters because it impacts our relationship with Jesus. It doesn't necessarily matter in an eternal sense of whether or not we'll pass or fail the heavenly test, uh, whether or not we'll, we'll measure up to the heavenly scoreboard. It makes sense in the sense that we want to please Jesus. And so we adjust our behavior in order to improve our relationship with him. That's all the time we have for today. Again, we're going to be moving to a Tuesday, Thursday uh, schedule for these devotionals. So I will see you on Thursday. Bye.